Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of a special series of podcasts. My name is Lucy and today I'm at the Between the Lines Festival run by Dimmox Busselton. Joining me is Bren McDibble. She has written three books for younger readers and a science fiction novel for young adults under the pen name Callie Black. Bren has also won and been shortlisted for a very long list of awards. <laughs> so welcome, how are you? Thank you, thank you for having me here. Missy. No worries. So we're going to start off with a bit of a quick fire round and I'm going to say this or that, this or that and just choose the first thing that comes to mind, okay? Okay. <laughs> so, smart or casual? Casual. Fiction or non-fiction? Fiction. Reading or writing? Oh, I reading. know, everyone gets stomped on that one. Oh. Left or right? Right. TV shows or movies? TV shows. Night or day? Sunset or sunrise? Sunset. I see more of those. Yeah. <laughs> Never up in the morning. Time. Rain or shine? Shine. Invisibility or flight? <gasps> I know. Invisibility. Cafe or restaurant? Cafe. Sweet or savoury? Savoury. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Yeah, most people choose coffee. <laughs> Okay, so this is a question I love to ask everyone, but when you begin a book, do you start with a character, place, or a concept, or something completely different? I kind of imagine a concept that I want to explore, so like elements of climate fiction or something like that, or something social, like in... um, in, In the dark spaces, I kind of wanted to explore the other, the alien, as well as a kind of a um, poverty trap, a kind of a working poor allegory. Mm. Um, But I can't really get started until I find the character who's going to lead me through Mm. because it's all character driven. So I have to create the character that's going to be in that world and explore that world for me. Mm. Yeah. And when you write, do you have a whole idea in mind or do you start with a little seed and just let it grow? Yeah, I just start off really small Mm. and I just write to explore that thing and then quite often I will come back and maybe start off in a different direction. I'm not afraid of writing too much or throwing things out, I think, because you kind of have to like explore stuff and sometimes you write yourself into a corner, you write something and you go, oh, well I didn't think it would go that way I don't want it to go that way so you come back a few steps and start Mm. off in a different direction Mm. so you like to kind of experiment with writing to see what happens yeah I like to experiment and see what's what's going to happen because I mean sometimes I don't know the ending I just head towards the most obvious ending and I know when I'm reading and you're heading towards an obvious ending and then something subverts yeah that's amazing and I think if you plan a book you're not going to get that yeah you're not gonna like get the story be subverted yeah definitely and the surprise and stuff so i like i like to um not plan too much in advance mm. just to have a good think about all the options yeah. all the things coming in just play. let it go yeah kind of see where it goes and if it goes the wrong direction i throw those scenes out so what i do is i write scene by scene mm. and i write in scrivener which lays out the scenes scene by scene mm. so if there's any scenes that don't work I can just put them in my bin down the bottom yeah yeah and if I want them later for a different part of the story I can pull them back up yeah so yeah it's really I think Scrivener has kind of revolutionized that idea that you can just keep writing scenes and then if those scenes are wrong you just pull them out yeah so you can kind of shift things yeah Yeah. shift the scenes around make, Mm. make the story different and in your first books for younger readers these beautiful ones here you explore what the future could look like if it were changed by environmental issues what research went into that i i thought i knew a bit about bees when i set off writing about bees but of course it's quite easy to hop online and learn more about bees and more about the threats the bees are facing and i went to visit um i went to visit a bee festival which was quite weird yeah <laughs> somebody rocked up with a hive and then all oh, these wow, experts yeah. were talking about bees and then people were just selling things with bees on them and <laughs> an artist from New Zealand had done a auditory artwork where they locked you in a dark room with all this buzzing yeah and then there's just crawling bees in front of you and it was actually quite horrible mm, and I was I like enjoy that, 
happy that we <laughs> It's like, how's this art? Mm. It's actually really annoying me because all that buzzing and then the only thing yeah, that happened was the bees were all crawling around the hive and mm. I'm like, okay, this is, this is really weird. But yeah. I'm going to immerse myself into the bee. Mm-hmm. I didn't learn much from that artwork. No. And I'm just, yeah. I think it was a bit of gothic music going on mm. in the background as well. That's odd. <laughs> but I knew it was art because I completely did not understand it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did a little bit of research into the bees and found out all about the threats that the bees are facing worldwide that mm. aren't here and things like that. Um, the, the, uh, the bees worldwide are facing the threat of um, deformed wing virus, which is carried by the varroa mite, mm. which is a little mite that burrows into the cells and, and sucks off the larva. Mm. So the larva come out weaker they also give them this virus at the same time so you've got weak bees some with deformed wings and mm. then when we start doing our pesticides and our monocropping which we've been doing which also harm our bees mm. we're really really putting our poor little domesticated mm. bees under a lot of pressure and the wild bees of course because yeah. yeah so that's yeah. that's an interesting issue yes yeah, so I researched that I got a grant to research the dog runner Mm. which is all about grass yeah. and that was fascinating research because you know you think grass grows on the ground and things eat it but oh my god I learned so much about soil health yeah when I went to talk to people who re- regenerate grasslands mm. and I learned about all the great grasslands around Australia so the Mallee and the Wimmera and over here in the wheat belt and how the ways we grow wheat and how damaging that is yeah. to our land and how the old grasses that used to inhabit those plains had massive roots that went down maybe three metres and Mm. they kept this fungus alive in the soil that that broke down everything in the soil and made the soil sticky and water absorbent. Mm. We don't have that because we constantly, after we grow our wheat, we cut it down and the roots in the soil die and um, then we till it over and then we put herbicide on it to stop weeds coming up and all that just basically kills all the fungi in the soil and the soil is getting really compacted with only a small layer of tilled stuff that can even absorb any water Mm. yeah so it was really fascinating there is a really good website to look into this and watch videos it's called kisstheground.com and in that a man in South Dakota his land which he switched back to rooted plants and keeping living roots in the soil and he still grows and sells food from he, um, his land now holds more water than the nearby reservoir. Wow, really? And he doesn't water his crops. Mm. He's saving so much money. And um, yeah, he just watches the neighbour water day after day. Mm. And he watches the neighbour every time it rains. He watches the, the land run off his land next door. Mm. And he's just like, why would you do that? You can do this and save so much money. Mm. So oftentimes I think the only people advising some farmers are the people who want to sell them pesticides and herbicides mm-hmm. and stuff and we kind of have to rethink what we do with our land and who's advising farmers and what's some good advice we can get out to them mm. yeah. yeah how about across the risen sea what kind of what oh, across the risen sea was harder to research because the science around sea level rising is it's it gets a bit lost yeah but there's um, inundation zones that the council has mm. and they know which houses will be closer to the water or under the water in which year so you can look up if you live near the coast um, where the sea level will be in relation mm. to your house in 50 years or 100 years or 200 years but when I found out that there were cities that were sinking like Jakarta has gone down yeah. 2.5 meters without even sea level rise it sunk that and the sea level is rising mm. because they take the bore water out and the city is heavy and it's yeah, on a plane yeah. and it's sinking. I think I've researched that before. It's really interesting. Yeah. And when I found that cities were sinking and knowing that climate change feeds climate change and any climate mm. change will start to speed up mm-hmm. um, and all the elements that feed into climate change will just make it go and become quite unstoppable. Knowing that, I thought, you know, I'm just going to lift the seas as much as I want. I'm going to return the yeah. inland seas to Australia and I'm just going to make this world not about what might happen in 10 years or 50 years or something. It's just going to be about how do people live if that happens. Mm. And when I started freeing up for that, 
um, I started writing more fun things in like mm. um, giant sharks, crocodiles, yeah. and all sorts of stuff, which was also um, which was also a lot of fun because Dogrin was quite serious. Yeah. And the threat is here and now. It was like to the characters, it was as it was happening. Mm. And I thought, you know, kids are seeing so much other stuff and they're getting anxiety. And I just wanted to write a book that was a little bit more fun. Yeah. Kids thriving and wanting the way of life, even though it's changed, mm. they're enjoying that way of life. So I had a bit more fun with Across the Risen Sea, and I think it's less fact based. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Why do you sometimes write under the pen name Kelly Black? Wow, Kelly Black. I write with a really intensive first person style with mm. a lot of physical emotion. Yeah. And in Kelly Black, a sp- it's a space freighter in space and aliens invade, and there's a bit of a human alien war going on. Mm. And then when I was writing the war, I was like, oh, I have to put, I have to put the violence in. It has to be you know part of it and it has to be honest mm. because it's physically a war and wars are ugly and messy and horrible and then because I write in such a um, physical like f- intensive yeah, you style feel the you can feel the horror the death and stuff so the concept is just alien invasion on a spaceship yeah but in, in actual fact um, it's not as bad as things like Hunger Games, where kids kill kids, yeah, yeah. or Scythe, where kids are taught to harvest mm-hmm. lives. I mean, those, those two have like shocking, mm. shocking ideas. But the way they're told kind of softens the idea mm. a bit. But when I write, I don't soften the idea. I kind of enhance it. Yeah. So I feel like um, mine's a little bit more graphic. And what I didn't want was... Um, grades four and five who are reading that to suddenly go oh another Brynn yeah, McDevitt pick it up <gasps> oh my um, gosh yeah, yeah third scene and everybody on the spaceship dies mm-hmm. oh no that was a spoiler you yeah, know they don't all die two live mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and um, then go oh my god look at the blood and stuff yeah. look at these dead people look at this poor girl like breaking down because of what's happened mm-hmm. and I just didn't want to horrify kids yeah um, I only wanted to horrify teenagers yeah <laughs> <laughs> And last but not least, can you tell us a bit more about your book, Across the Risen Sea? Oh, Across the Risen Sea. So it's set in the future. The Australia's great inland seas have returned. And over time, Australia's cities have moved to higher ground and built sea walls. Mm-hmm. So they're okay. But the government, like the rural areas and the outbacks, they're kind of like cut off by sea now. Yeah. And so the government has just abandoned those lands. But the people living there have kind of put their lives back together, moved to higher ground, and they're living in small communities, and they've taken up fishing and a little bit of farming, Mm -hmm. and lots of scavenging from fallen buildings and reusing a lot of stuff. So they're really environmentally friendly. And then a new government sails in. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in the concept that Australia is so close to Asia, and we pretend it's not there. and the new government sail in and they put technology on the hill and they were like, no, no, we don't use technology. We kind yeah. of like are very quite simple lives and gentle lives. And then one of the new government turns up dead. And because they can't figure out who killed that person, mm. they take the boy, a boy from the village. But the thing is, this boy and the main character were going to be the best fishing and salvage team in the whole of the Inland Sea. They're the, some of the oldest kids there and they look after the young kids and they do heaps of sailing and fishing and they've got lots of skills and their plan was they were going to be the best team at fishing and salvaging Mm. together and when he goes um, Naomi the girl has to go after him and rescue him back from the government Mm. so she has to first find him and she has to go across the open sea instead of the inland sea and there's crocodiles and sharks and crazy Mm. pirate hags Mm -hmm. who who want to enslave her Um, And then she has to bring him back, and um, if she can do that, they still have to figure out who killed the person in order for the government to stop pursuing them. So Mm -hmm. it's this, like, there's a bit of a mystery, and there's a lot of adventure, Mm -hmm. and there's, like, girl saves boy. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, it's an absolutely (laughs) fantastic book. I've read it so many times. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. But that is it. Thank you so much for coming and letting me drill you. And thank you everyone for watching this episode of the Red Lucy podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a like, make sure to subscribe and share with all your friends. Goodbye and keep reading.
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs>